Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Maher, and I'd like to welcome you all tonight to the launch of Yelling, or the launch of Give Me Your Little Pleasure. Do you have to yell Quiet. Give me your little pleasure. <laughs> Quiet. Give me your little pleasure. <laughs> Give me your little pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so tonight we have Lisa Robertson and Aisha Sasha John, who are going to be in conversation about each other's work, and I think they've been cooking up stuff today, what they're going to do. So I'm just going to turn it over to them. And, I, and um, oh, wait. Yes. Without further ado, Lisa Robertson and Aisha Sasha John. <laughs> okay, I, I used to live in France. I lived in California for a few years. Um, that big crash of 2008 happened, so there's no jobs, right? So I had to go somewhere. And I decided to go back to France because um, I love it there. And I live deep in the countryside, um, in a house on the edge of fields, in um, um, a so called place, a lieu de of uh, three houses. <laughs> And uh, basically, one farmer drives past by several times every day, and also the post lady comes six days a week. Um, and um, um, I can't afford to live in cities. You know, I decided to go be insane and go freelance again. <laughs> so um, France seemed like a good place to go freelance again. Um, and um, I'm, um, I, I don't like to live in a monolingual world. Mm -hmm. I, no place is mon monolingual, but let's say I'm less motivated to, to learn other languages when I'm in, um, living in American or Canadian mm -hmm. cities. Um, and I love French, so I'm just trying to become a person who hopefully will become bilingual. Mm -hmm. And I do some um, translation from French to English, um, both poetry and um, linguistics. Mm -hmm. um, Henri, I, I translate with um, a collaborator named Avro Spector, and uh, we're translating Henri Méchani and Emile Bandiniste together. Mm -hmm. And mostly we're studying that. Mm -hmm. we, our, our productivity is very young. <laughs> yeah. We basically read these guys together and talk about it, and um, and uh, the food's really good in France. <laughs> I buy all my food from the people who grow it and yeah, milk it. It's <laughs> amazing. So I like that. So you mentioned that you're reading, and I want to talk about that. Um, I want you to. Talk about your sort of erotics of reading that you've given us here. But I'm curious, I mean, you said you want to be, how good is your French, like in terms of reading? Um, it's pretty good. It's, it's pretty like, good. I never studied French in, in, yeah. in a university context. Yeah. Um, and I had to, first my French became comfortable in a sort of village vernacular way. Yeah, yeah. So I basically, when I went to Paris, I sounded like an 
eight-year-old village boy. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that was interesting. Um, and then I kind of trained myself to get over my um, dislike of reading French mm. because it was so slow and mm. arduous mm. just by, you know, reading the newspaper every day with the dictionary mm. and then by reading pornography. Mm. Oh, really? That's yes. how you taught yourself French? Yeah. That is so brilliant. That makes so much sense. <laughs> 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 um, okay, because, oh, okay, so, like, Rayage, or, like, yes. other, yeah, oh, yeah, so you read her first in French. Yeah, yeah, that was oh. the first book I read, cover to cover in French. Really? <laughs> that makes so much sense. Yeah. Okay. That is very yeah. motivating. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. exactly. Um, Subtitle. Oh, I mean, I think the vocabulary maybe should be really. Maybe limited. we should explain it, but there's an essay in this book. Yes. Yes. That's called um, "Lastingness," um, and it's an essay about grieving, and it's um, just trying to describe and think about what it was like to be reading the three books I happened to be reading in the same period of time. The way all of us just happened to be reading some weird hodgepodge of things, and um, what the three books were is um, Pauline Reyes's, um story of O, East Waldo, mm -hmm. and um, Hannah Arendt's um, The Life of the Mind, and Lucretius's um, um, the, On the Nature of Things. Mm -hmm. So it's an essay that explores what reading um, might be uh, via the coincidence of, of reading these three books um, back and forth and through one another the way we do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a, a section from that okay. essay. Um, while I'm looking for it, the reason I asked you how good your French was, I was yeah, wondering, I it's like, it, yeah, is like when you read French, are you able to enter the kind of space that you describe in, say, the first and second essay? Like, are, is it a, are, are you able to get that sort of quiet? No. What, one of the reasons I like reading French is because it, I mean, like I'm sure every person in this room, uh, we all read really a lot, a lot of literature, a lot of poetry, a lot of criticism. And you know, we've been doing that as amazingly decades go by as they seem to do. You, you get pretty comfortable at placing things as you're reading and making um, um, aesthetic and critical judgments about what you're reading and sort of lining them up in camps. And, and it can be very, very hard to stop doing that. And in French, I don't have that, and I don't have any of that background as a reader. And so it, brings me back to that really wonderful density of incapability, mm -hmm. um, where it's hard to read, mm -hmm. and I don't know how to place or judge or think about what I'm reading, because I'm just really in the thick of it, just <coughs> trying to figure it out. And so it's kind of like um, um, a regression in a way to like, you know, being a teenager trying to read philosophy, mm -hmm. when you're just mm -hmm. going, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's really, really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And one set, the movement from one sentence to another doesn't, you know, really add up mm -hmm. necessarily. Um, and so that, that, you know, and obviously the longer you continue reading, the more you lose that, um, that, that beautiful density. Um, but that sort of became my motivation, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's, it remains my motivation in, in, in reading in French because I, I it return it, I get to be a kind of adolescent reader, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, I, I get to be just really unknowledgeable and mm -hmm. um, incapable, mm -hmm. and it's really a luxury. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we, we say. Um, in one of your essays, a reader is a beginner. And it seems like you're describing that sort of like the, the, the French allows you to have that beginningness, that mentality. Can you, can, you, can you talk about that a little bit more? Like not just reading in French, but what, in what ways is a reader a beginner? <coughs> um, 
there's Dealey in every way, yeah. you know. I mean, I mean, um, I I wish I could always read by um, abandoning anything I think I know already. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. Um, I mean, we, we're all very well trained in contextualizing, mm. and that word is ubiquitous in our vocab mm -hmm. in our critical vocabulary. Um, but uh, I mean, uh, and and obviously, I'm not against this as yeah. a, 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 as as a, a mode of, of framing our activities and thinking about our activities relationally. But um, it can be um, fabulous to abandon all position mm -hmm. and um, um, stay with the the movement of uh, phonemes and syntax. Mm -hmm. Um, at that level, and yeah. um, and not project, not project um, a prior history yeah. onto the experience we're having with the text. Yeah. To stay with this difficult, to stay with difficulty, um, as as a, a like a pleasurable difficulty yeah. Yeah. that's not unfrustrating. Yeah, yeah, um, but um, is um, yeah. As you're talking, like. Do you think that there's a relationship between that pleasurable difficulty and our bodies, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I could say that I feel as in my life, as time goes on, I, I read sort of from higher and higher up, you know what I mean? Yeah. Until it feels like you're kind of running from your hairline or something. <laughs> yeah. And whatever um, knowledge might exist below your hairline just kind yeah. of but doesn't enter the picture. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, this sort of difficulty is, you know, I mean, we, you know, we hunch and we bend a book yeah. and uh, yeah. we toss it aside yeah. and you know or yeah. there's two books inside one another and, yeah. yeah you know and yeah. you know and then you take your glasses off and you know because <laughs> yeah. they're dirty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but then it's not any better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the yeah the the all of the knowledge of the body and then also I mean the 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 quieting of what we think the body knows mm. so that a different perceiving can happen as part of reading. Mm. I mean, um, I've, I've, I've been involved in reading more and more um, alternative, um, um, learning more and more about alternative medical and health practices. and. Um, one thing that I've been really interested to learn about is, I mean, we tend to believe that our minds are lodged in um, our neural matter up here, but our um, the, the the neurons that you know <laughs> make our perceiving mm -hmm. are um, actually more predominant in, in our guts. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There, you know, yeah. our, our our guts actually think and. Yeah. and you know, the sort of locus of, of um, the human yeah. has keeps shifting, you know. I mean, um, for a long time it was the heart. Yeah. yeah. That's like the mind was yeah. in the heart. That's the wrong side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My heart is here. <laughs> <laughs> if you're dyslexic. <laughs> but, you know, and so it's really easy for us to think that the mind is in the head, yeah. like we just kind of believe it, yeah. you know, like we tap our heads yeah. and we think our heads yeah. are thinking, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but um, actually thought is produced by neural synapses that are going on through the entire body, yeah. and not, there's not just like a few down there that are then, you know, giving some information to what's here, it's um, thinking is a uh, transcorporal, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and I would say between bodies as well, yeah. Yeah. you know, so um, I don't really know what to do with that thought yeah. except to try to remember from time to time yeah. and then 
see what happens as time passes. Yeah. And I keep trying to remember that. The idea that thinking happens between bodies and is yeah. transportable? Yes. Um, did you know, I want to go back to this idea of thinking being between bodies, that the octopus sees with its skin? <laughs> oh. That's too beautiful, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'll just I'll leave that with you. Um, <laughs> chew on. I was tempting one day, and I was like looking at the octopus and just like, holy shit. Anyways, um, thinking happening between bodies. What would the, what are maybe some of the consequences for poetry if thinking happens between bodies? It's hard for me to think in terms of consequences. Um, I mean, I think that that's what this is what what moves poetry. Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what else would you want? Or implications. To, yeah. What else would yeah. you want to be involved in poetry? Yeah. Like, really. Yeah. Um, um, if it's not moving from body to yeah. body. Yeah. And if it's not the trace of your um, experience of that movement in some sense. I mean, this is what. This is what makes language historical and yeah. political. Yeah. This yeah. is a, sort of the, 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 the foundation of um, historicity and um, political consciousness to me is a movement between bodies mm -hmm. and um, in time. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you say, which I think is a gorgeous uh, sentence, I'm only certain that I think insofar as I read. Is that what's happening in terms of the between bodies via the book? Is that some of what's happening there? I think that's a really interesting um, reading of that. Yeah. I mean, I think what, what the, the reason I ended up writing that sentence down and keeping it was because I was, I was reading a one of the biographies of Wittgenstein, Monk, is that the guy who bi wrote the biography of Wittgenstein? Yeah. Ray Monk or something like that. Anyways, in this book, Wittgenstein, you know, there's a lot of quotation from letters and stuff. And what, what Wittgenstein described as thinking, and that he was certain what thinking was, was something that, honestly, the more I read this book, the more I thought, I've never experienced this. <laughs> <laughs> I've never experienced anything like what this man is saying what thinking is. And that was really, really fascinating to me. And I tried to sort of, you know, heavenly differentiate, you know, thinking from feeling, thinking from... And it just sort of seemed... I, I mean, I had none of the training or capability or, or capacities that, um, you know, um, a body like Wittgenstein's yeah. has clearly, and it seemed like when I feel um, at my sort of mental liveliness, yeah. liveliest, or yeah. I, when yeah. I was reading that, I felt, um. or when I was writing that, I felt like I was at my sort of liveliest, yeah. Um, in terms of like questioning, refuting, okay. yeah. expanding. Yeah. Yeah. When I was yeah. in a you know a, a, a really um, engaged reading yeah. process, except yeah. now I s realize as I say that that you know um, I feel like I'm thinking right now yeah. as you're talking because, to me. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. it's again yeah. it's this um, it's this betweenness yeah. Yeah. to me. Yeah. It's it's. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's this, well, it's the same, I guess I see it as the same thing. It's a conversation, he's just dead, and it was written down. We're, I'm alive, and we're talking. Mm -hmm. um, he can't hear your wrestling, but um, I think, yeah, I, I think that for me anyways, that I didn't know what to do with that. When I, when I read it, I sort of like, hmm. Um, I guess if I was a little bit suspicious of it, sort of privileging the book, but what is the book but a body, a recorded body? This is exactly you know? what I wanted to yeah. ask you, yeah. Aisha. Yeah. What is a book? Um, that's a big question for me. I mean, that's part of it, like a, 
Um, I mean, in so much as far as I've expressed it in this text, or just generally? Both. What is a book? Um, yes, don't. <laughs> a book is... Okay, I, I'm going to answer this by way of an a anecdote. There's a poet. I don't know her name. She is Mexican. Indigenous. She is dead. She is talked about in terms of ethnopoetics because she was a healer. Maria Sabina. Thank you. Thank you. And if someone would do it, if I gave enough clues. Okay. <laughs> so, I was, um, have you heard of her? No. So, she uh, is a healer, like I said, and um, her poetry, I almost want to put quotes around poetry because she, she her, what she did was in the context of healing and medicine, right? And northerners came and, 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 and founded poetry. And who's the name of the person who's like published it and stuff? The published her work? No, but like there's some American poet who got excited about her and like made her. Clayton Nishelman? Rottenberg or Jerez? Yeah. I think one of those names that you said. So I'm not good with details. I'm not good with details. <laughs> okay? The point, the point is, she, in her healing practice, she would consume mushrooms and, and speak, okay? And she would, say, she would always talk about the book. And she was illiterate, right? But she had a book, she had a catalog that she spoke from when she was um, speaking. And so, what is the book? I mean, she doesn't have access to the book. We're talking about the codex in your text. Like, I think the book is just a, a technology, and I don't just mean in the, it is a technology, but I mean it's a, a uh, an organized clumps of, of, of stuff. So I don't even know what to say beyond that. I think it's a fucking huge question. And it is one of my questions, which is why it's stumping me. Yeah. What is the book? Um, I, it's a vessel. It's a cup. Yeah. Uh, it's a face. It's another body. It's all those things. Well, one of the first words that comes into my mind, yeah. Um, when I try to calm down, yeah, is um, intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a, it's yeah, not not privacy, but mm -hmm. in intimacy. Mm -hmm. That um, and <coughs> I mean to say that the book is a metaphor is sort of what I mean, but I also. Hate that that sounds like a yeah yeah sounds like what we yeah. what sounds yeah. like because yeah. um, maybe we'll stop thinking when we say that but um, like if we, if you think that a metaphor is a clump yeah and a cup and a face yeah and that yeah. we can make this this pr progression from you know clump to cup to face mm. and um, and. The, 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 the movements between these um, word, figure, sound, mm -hmm. ideas, those movements are extremely intimate and they can only happen in that instant that you instant that you were struggling to um, let your let your excitement yeah. <laughs> go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and that um, that sort of clumping intimacy and um, that um, 
deep engagement with um, um, an instantaneous uh, um, the, is it, the other as pure difference. Mm. That's really, I mean, a, a book is about as other as you can get. Hmm. But and I'm yeah. not, and I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, poets, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, you know, yeah. like me saying that I love reading French because um, I just don't really get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that not getting it takes me deeper and deeper into being in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mm. What um kind of string off but that's okay. Yeah. What else does intimacy like do you think anything else does intimacy like the book? I'm just gonna read a line that this just popped open to in Alicia's book. Book, you're no more a friend than my thighs. <laughs> Pardon? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read from yours now. Um, <laughs> not the only one. Um, I'm going to read that Riage piece if I can find it. But, okay, we're talking about. Uh, okay. Do you like film? Of course you oh, do. Oh, totally. <laughs> Hands up if you don't like film. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, when I want intimacy, if it's quiet and, like, I think I said this to you in an email, it's cold out, it's, not, it's cold in the house, the sky is white. Sometimes I'll put in a, a film and I'll just turn it off immediately or, like, after two minutes because it has its own fucking time. And I have no choice but to just sit back and be with this film's time. And what I love about the book mm -hmm. is how I can negotiate time in a book. And you oh. talk about this, and I was like, yes, I can rewind, I can fast forward, I can dig a dig a dig like yes. this. Like, and there's something about the relationship to time and whether it's yes. narrative or not that happens in a book that yes. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about. I just want to say yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, let me find this damn thing. Oh, because it's. It's okay. It doesn't have to be awkward that I'm looking for this. <laughs> it's not awkward at all. <laughs> because I did put a sticky note, and if that happens to fall out, that is not my fault. Here we go. Found it. Okay, so I just wanted to read this part that um, we talked about already. Uh, there's a this that you won't know. It's okay. You don't need to know. Just stand there. This is an abbreviated background for my immersion in a text whose anarchism is a sustained, feral, and relentless as it is elegantly poised. This is Lisa talking about the story of both. I think this is the magic formula of O. Each limit or expectation one could have regarding the relation of the subject to desire, to power, to sex, to identity is systematically obliterated, but this happens in a language whose stylistic achievement is so restrained, so balanced, so modest that the reader has the feeling she is participating with sublime effortlessness in a mask. The only obscenity is the reader's repeated need to stop and build a moral defense against her own identificatory immersion in the imaginary of the text, her own identification with a punitive sadism. This complex tension, hold on actually, does everybody know what the story goes about? Just at a basic level. So, I haven't read it, but I know it's, a, it's about this woman and and her lover, and she writes, she wrote these letters to her, him, sorry, de detailing this like, um, these like masochistic sort of sexual adventures. Is that like a fair enough? That's not totally accurate, yeah. but. The, the, the character O is taken to a castle. Okay. Um, and um, by her lover, and is, um, agrees to become enslaved. 
Okay. To a community of men. Okay. Whom she serves sexually. Okay. So this is the context in terms of the tension that she's describing. Um, the only obscenity is the reader's repeated need to stop and build a moral defense against her own identificatory immersion in the imaginary of, of the text, her own identification with the punitive sadism. This complex tension between the sinuous ease of the text as a styled object, the question it allegorizes around the relation between embodied will and desire and complicity, and thus the political, and the reader's suspension between a received moral hygiene of gender and a free fall into a fantastical extreme of the imagined embodiment of power and desire. This confused yet poised tension says things about thinking and reading themselves as open forms of sustained erotic anarchy. We copy edit that later, I just want to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some tripping that's happening, but that's okay. I think that the, yeah. it's getting communicated. Yeah. Um, I read that anyways, and was just like, wow. So, for you, here, the story of Old Out is a, can be read as an allegory. It bears allegory. Oh, yeah, I, I, I read it as an allegory. I mean, um, the, the writer, um, Dominique Garvey, who wrote it as Pauline Freyesh, um, she was um, in the resistance during the Second World War in Paris, and um, many of the people who she worked with in the resistance were murdered by the Nazis or imprisoned. And um, she herself had grown had, had sort of come into young adulthood and intellectual life actually in the radical right in France. Um, um, as had Blanchot. She, she met Blanchot in that, that context and they, they became um, very, very close friends and she was his main editor. Um, so I feel that um, um, I feel that the, the questions of, of complicity and power that she is, um, and identity that she's examining in this, this text um, um, are, are, you know, it's, it's, it's clearly an a allegorical con construct. I can't say it's an allegory of, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the politics of complicity in, in uh, the French uh, war and post-war period. Oh, I just want to go back to say she was in the radical right, and then she she switched sides. She switched sides before the Second World War, um, as anti-Semitism was becoming more and more explicitly what it was, and and um, I mean the the obscenity of anti of anti-Semitism was what caused her to totally reject her her early intellectual um, context. And you know, she left her husband, who was in that in that world, and um, she w entered the resistance as a resistance worker, and she she never looked back. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, I I I became I did not fully reread Bakhtin's. Um, Rabelais and his world. Mm -hmm. I did not fully reread it as I was um, thinking about and, and reading um, the story of O, um, but I was mentally referring to it a lot mm -hmm. and remembering it. And, um, you know, I think that that's definitely um, one way to think of that book, and also by uh, um, uh, Walter, Walter Benjamin's um, work on Baroque allegory. So we're back to the question of reading, and I think it's described somewhere as a, this collection, I think you described somewhere as a book about reading. And so maybe can we, I'd just like to hear you talk maybe just directly on what reading is for you, and how writing can sort of come off the back of reading. 
Well, yeah, I don't, in a way, I can't even see the two activities in, in, my, in my own life mm. um, and in my own just habits as being separate. Mm. Um, um, I, you know, they're, they're just so entirely um, engendering of one mm. another as activities. I mean, I often begin writing, at, you know, I begin writing as I'm reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, and the other way around too. Um, but I, I mean, I just sort of, as you were asking me that question, I was also asking of something that I wanted to ask yeah. you. Yeah. And um, um, this word um, that that you sort of lift and give us so beautifully, grace. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt like I just want to say, you know, is, is reading grace? What is grace mm -hmm. to you? Is reading grace? No, I mean, no. I, like, my instinct is no. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, reading is... Um, I'm going to read one other sentence that you wrote here. Writing, propo oh, no. I need a bit of a context. Writing proposes itself as a possible technique towards lastingness. And the lastingness is in relation to reading. Um, for me, reading is, and the kind of, the relationship that you describe in my practice, I would say that's 60% of it. But there's another 40% or something. I don't know, that's kind of an arbitrary number. Um, that isn't connected to reading. I mean, it's always connected, but it isn't connected so intimately or so closely. And so I guess, I'm, like, do you write from, like we talked, um, this is sounding cheesy, but I don't care, because it's real. Um, when, when you write from experience, when experience is so, um, intense, does that bring you to the page outside of a reading context? Well, reading is experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but not you're sort of, experience. You're kind of asking a question about beginning. Or That's, yeah, that is what I'm asking. asking a question yeah. about beginning yeah. and, and what what is beginning in, in, in writing. I guess, yeah, I think mean, it's a good way. And, yeah. um, I mean, you, you are so fortunate to have this background in, in dance and to have come to writing through dance. Um, I, would, I, I don't know if I came to writing through dance, but, but anyways, I'm, I'm curious to what your, the connection. Um, experience and it, I can only think of experience indirectly. I mean, I'm not really sure what, ex, I mean, I know, I'm not trying to be coy, yeah. but I was going to say, I'm not really sure what experience is. Mm. I mean, what yeah. can we say it is? I mean, a, a, anybody has, you know, there would be um, philosophical definitions of what, you know, you know, phenomenological description of what experience is. Um, but it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a kind of agency <clears throat> mode which I can only kind of glimpse, glimpse from the side. Yeah. Oh, I, I like and the way that you talked about beginnings though. Because uh -huh. that's, I think that is be a better way of putting what I'm talking about. To me, beginning is yeah. oblique. It's yeah. like there's something that I haven't quite experienced. Yeah. There's something that as I'm facing this way, I sense something's happened over there. So it's like, it's understood. And that's yeah. what, that's what um, um, happens all the time when I'm reading, you know, I mean, this sort of misunderstanding. Suddenly mm -hmm. the text is something that it, it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, 
it's something that you were sure it wasn't, yeah. and it starts happening elsewhere. And it's that that sort of that 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 swerve of things starting to happen yeah. elsewhere that would be for me how I would describe what beginning writing is. Hmm. So, hmm. okay, like it never begins by you know facing in the direction you're heading. Yeah. <laughs> for me. Yeah. It, it, you know, it, 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 it begins, um, it begins by tripping and falling, <laughs> or, yeah. or, um, I mean, I, I, some, some of this book is talking about Lucretius and Lucretius and, and, um, I've hoped for a long time that at some point in my life I might be able to translate Lucretius, but, it's um, increasingly obvious that I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, but Latin when, it or, or want, it, my Latin's be. just <laughs> really not there. But um, the, 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 the Epicurean swerve, the clinament mm. that Lucretius talks about, that he, he describes um, this, 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 um, this um, radical, difference mm. that, that suddenly something happens elsewhere that was not happening that every atom has in it um, the potential to move in a way that was not caused I mean the, the, the swerve yeah. of Klinemann is, yeah. is, is unca uncaused yeah. motion yeah. so motion that's not coming from itself yeah. Um, that would describe what beginning is, or what um, what writing is mm. to me. That mm. that that uncaused motion mm. that's inherent to material materiality. Because mm. you can never really trace any kind of beginning. There's too many. There's just too. It's like infinite. No, it's not the same as like a um, at origin. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's in, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, I want to read. Can I yeah. ask you, yeah. Grace? What is Grace? Oh, what is Grace? <laughs> <laughs> you ask me all these hard ass questions, man. <laughs> oh, you um, don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I recognize Grace when I see it. I, I think that if 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 there's one philosophical, I mean, there's a few that I have. That's one of them. What is Grace, and how to attain it? Um, I think that there's a relationship between grace and honesty. I think I've, I've come to that. There's something about honesty and grace. Now, what's honesty? Then I came to, um, and I, I'm working on this in my writing practice, but also in my dance practice, because I want grace. I don't know about you guys, but that's what I want. And um, so I was like, okay, there's something about Honesty and grace, what's honesty? What's truth? I think that there's something about desire. I think that I think that you can actually look at honesty is very big, but maybe it's not so big if you think about desire. I can talk about what I want. You know, there can be truth in that. What do I want? Like I want this water right now. Yeah. <laughs> um sometimes that sometimes it's not actually that clear of what you want. Sometimes it's actually quite difficult, which I've, which I've discovered actually mostly through dance. I'm like, what do I, I Just really quickly, I'm an improvised dancer. Um, I work with scores. My score has been uh, to be an honest dancing body. And I've been, at, so I've been for 10 minutes sort of like moving with that intention, like what do I honestly want to do now? And it's sometimes really hard to figure that out. And you know what? When we talk about bodies, I think that part of the reason it's hard to figure out is because I'm expecting the answer from up, up here. Yeah. And there is no answer up there. Or so I think grace might actually have to do with um, wholeness also. Again, I don't know. And these are, I think, big things, or 
I'm, I'm conscious about how that sounds, but whatever. Like, so something about desire, like what if you were able to follow your desire and not without any of the imperatives that exist for what you should be at any given time, in any given context, what you should be as a as an adult, as a as a poet, as a anything. Like, what if you could strip those if you could just like kick those imperatives off? That to me is kind of where I'm looking at in terms of grace. Like, what then? What would be there? Um, if that permission, if that kind of like full, full, full permission was possible. Um, and, 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 and you talk about friendship here, and I, I loved that because I think that grace. I think some of these things are just coming, surf, like coming around. But like, I think that I experience grace in relationships, like in friendships, and which I experience a shared grace um, all the time. And I and I think that might be what love is. God, listen to me. But like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but like, but I don't. I don't know. Maybe that's the thing. Maybe that's where I'm wrong. Maybe I'm looking at a grace as a oneness, and maybe it's never a oneness. Maybe grace is always shared. And like, you're talking about prosody in that same sense. Mm -hmm. um, can you share with them <laughs> a bit about how how prosody for you isn't necessarily just like measure in, in <coughs> what could prosody be or is. Okay, I'll just give a little bit of quick context on the question. Um, there's um, an essay in here um, that's called, oh, Untitled Essay? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, um, that's, um, it's basically trying to explore uh, what a prosody of citizenship would mean. Um, by looking at um, um, the words um, um, kivis and domus and trying to take um, citizenship and the, the citizenship and the domestic sphere um, trying to kind of um, um, untie this sort of binary relationship that we've put them in this sort of public private you know gendered etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, um, and it does, um, I, I do this by um, looking at some of the um, etymological critique of Emile Benveniste, mm -hmm. and um, he talks about very early uses, uses of these two words, kivis and domus, not as being spatial, um, but as being um, relational. And so both of these sort of um, um, modes are relational modes that have more to do with scale than of any than of than with qualitative difference. Um, so um, I became interested then at, at, at thinking of um, citizenship and domesticity as um, not as sighted mm -hmm. um, activities but as um, relational movements. And um, um, I've been really excited and really, really influenced for a few years now. And I just keep rereading this essay, also by Benveniste, on the concept of rhythm. Mm -hmm. And um, where he, again, we tend to think of rhythm as being the same, more or less the same as meter, as being an alteration, a regular alteration of beat. And um, Benveniste goes back into, um, into um, basically Aristotle's citations of Democritus and sort of uncovers um, a different meaning for rhythm mm -hmm. that was happening outside of Plato's um, later sort of marrying of rhythm and meter into a, a single meaning. And so he's, he's deregulating rhythm and also sort of denaturing rhythm and saying that what rhythm is is, um, 
is um, a passing disposition. Um, it's, it's how, for, and he would give us an example, two examples he gives us how rhythm is a passing disposition. Um, the folds of cloth in a garment as it moves. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, a more sort of technical but also as beautiful um, um, example he gives is um, the, 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 the capital letter A and the capital letter M. Um, they're both um, three, three straight strokes, um, but they're, in each case the three strokes are in a different relation to one another and um, are, are um, marked in a different sequence. So that sort of um, passing character of um, marks in relationship in time, mm -hmm. that is what rhythm is. And then he said that Plato, ironically, well, not exactly, but interestingly, mm -hmm. in Plato's um, discussion of dance, um, he was the one who, who turned the word rhythm into meaning like a, into a temporal regulatory mm -hmm. um, metrics. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this um, other meaning of rhythm as being a, um, a temporal relational um, disposition mm -hmm. um, um, has been developed in French linguistics by Henri Méchamic and developed into a different concept of prosody, where prosody is not, you know, it's, it's, it's not about um, um, a description of metrics in language. Um, prosody is about um, um, an opening up of um, the, the, the profoundly historical and relational um, um, aspect of language. And so I've been really interested in trying to think of prosody in this very opened way in relation to vernaculars, um, the idea of the vernacular and this um, um, temporal um, reading of um, um, domestic, and, domestic and civic um, dispositions, mm -hmm. modes of relation. So this has been really, really part of my excitement about this thinking that I'm finding um, with my collaborator, Avra Spector, who I study this work with and sometimes translate this work with, um, Meishanik's work and some of ben Benveniste's work, is because it's just so difficult for me. It was so hard mm -hmm. to let go of rhythm as, okay. you know, um, the beating of the heart, the, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, like, he, he, he begins in this essay by showing that um, the traditional etymology of the word rhythm, um, it's, it's, it's attached to the, the Indo-European root, supposedly, rhyme, which means something like flowing, but also something like the regular motion of the waves, mm -hmm. Benveniste says, well, first of all, flowing and waves are not the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, flowing is not waves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are two very, very different movements. Um, and he, he mm -hmm. just kind of very elegantly in like two paragraphs completely <clears throat> shoots down the, um, the, the traditional etymology of rhythm and then mm -hmm. starts reconstructing um, from this, this historical perspective, from using um, 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 instances, usage, mm -hmm. instances of usage in, um, in philosophy, in Adamist philosophy, this different meaning. And it was so, it was kind of easy to let go of the myth of regularity and beat, but it was very hard to um, because it's, you know, it's fun to let go of regularity. <laughs> but it was very hard to move from there to what the hell he actually meant that it did mean. Mm -hmm. And what the entire essay performs is um, um, showing up, he, he shows how 
um, concepts are metaphors. And he shows how um, um, our perception of um, our hearts as being rhythmic or as the, 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 you know, the, the water pounding on the shore as being rhythmic is actually the result of a really, really complex um, series of discourses and discussions mm -hmm. and, um, and, and hard thinking mm -hmm. and, and slippages in usage and meaning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he, basically sh he basically shows that the things that we think are the absolutely most natural things, like even to our experience of our body, like what could be more natural than thinking that the heart is rhythmic? Or that the breath is rhythmic, um, that this notion is 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 a construction, um, but this is not to say that it doesn't exist. Um, but it's profoundly beautiful, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. how we how we um, project irregularity or shapeliness onto what is you know, um, you know purely unfounded relation is, is really, really interesting. Mm. So that's a super, super long non-answer to <laughs> but point to my interest in trying to <laughs> remember the question was. Prosody. <laughs> like I don't know what prosody yeah. is, is, yeah. is is the short yeah. answer. Yeah. Because yeah. um because I had to just totally unlearn what rhythm was. Yeah. And I had to do that because it was such a pleasure to <coughs> learn what rhythm was. Yeah. Um, so once I've, I'm con can constantly trying to unlearn what rhythm is, what can prosody become mm. historically, politically? Anyways. Just as you were, as I was listening to you, some of which I knew, some of which I didn't know, this thing about the undoing of the idea of the heart is being a construction. That sort of, sort of, ah, that sort of, in my, ah, like, oh wow, there's sort of a freedom. It's like, in that, if that's the case, then what else is, or just sort of how that keeps going, that's reading. Like, I just had a moment of re, of, I've had that thing. Do you know what I mean? Or like that idea that you just presented to me, I mean, you presented it, it's not reading, but, because I didn't read it, but that idea that you communicated to me for, is the kind of thing, is that beginning thing. It's like, I'm a beginner now because you just provided me with a, 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 a lens that I've never seen, and I just have now new glasses. The new glasses are the idea of rhythm, this basic idea, is a construction. Holy shit. I know, like I know. Like, it's just, it just, yeah. you know. I've read that essay maybe like twenty or thirty yeah. times now. Yeah. Always with difficulty. Yeah. And every single time I finish reading it, I just feel like I've become somebody different. Yeah. Well, it's just you great. are. You, so. Yeah. yeah. Um. I feel like we've made this really great. Circle, yeah, and so let's go back to France. Yes, yes, yes. I'm gonna read uh, for you um, something that there's a poet, Ariana Rhines, who I'm a big fan of, and she was asked by SF MoMA to do something, and the thing that she did was write an essay in verse in response to a Flaubert story. The story is, uh, God, I forget the name of it, but it's about a Parrot? There's a parrot in it. Lulu, trois contes. Un cœur simple. Thank you. <laughs> Bad memory. I was listening to this. Yes, anyways. So she's being interviewed about this, and she says, and I thought that this was um, because of her relationship to France, I wanted to know how you, uh, what you think about this. So she says, something, something, something. <sighs> I don't have page four. Of style in Flaubert as an ex oh I see I think <laughs> something like that um, I experience style in Flaubert as an expression of misery I see any obsession with fash as with fashion as an expression of occidental misery 
<laughs> the French represent the, the perfection of this misery. They always have, and they still do. Now, this is not to say this misery isn't elsewhere in the world, but in French culture, it's a jewel. It's a gem. <laughs> the way I read the pathos of Flaubert, I see the perfection of his style as the utterly perfect expression of total failure, the misery of this culture. I just like, uh, we just read this earlier in your apartment, and I was just totally blown away by this because for me, she could be describing the Pauline Reich um, mm -hmm. story of O. Um, that is like um, the expression of the total misery of style. Um, and it's also um, a clear expression of the total failure of the, um, the, the Occidental project. Um, it's, you know, maybe, maybe that is its allegory. It's the failure of the West. And um, I feel that I want to um, um, approach as um, close to the sort of soft pulp of that failure as mm. possible and um, stay with that uh, failure of um, failure of the Occident, that utter abjection of, um, of, of the Occident. And I feel like I can um, be more there with that failure um, when, I, when I'm there. Mm. So we wanted to end with the the failure of the oxen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to us. <laughs>